Um, to begin, first of all, welcome. I'm glad you're all here. First, I'd like to introduce us. Uh, the three of us that worked on the program here are Larry Furrow, Robin Mueller, who probably put in more hours than both Larry and I and myself combined, and I'm Bob Wheeler. Uh, we're members of the Copper Country Ancient Sites Conservancy, and our mission statement, the purpose of the CCASC is to facilitate the identification, protection, and professional investigation of the ancient archaeological sites of Lake Superior's Copper Country, while also promoting the education of the general public concerning ancient archaeology. Um, other board members here are Bob Nemiroff sitting on the side and Ralph Lund, who I expect at some point. Um, I'd also like to, Mike, to mention uh, Mike Lynch, who was a, our first vice president and a founding member, who is a good man and he's no longer with us. Um, what we've been looking at is the Whittlesley map, a uh, map from 18, 1862, I believe, showing some of the um, ancient pits and ancient workings. Um, first, I turned it to the north. I'm a land survey technician. So I need to have things oriented north to feel better about it. So that's oriented north. Uh, this is a modern map, modern photo, with the red dot being where we are right now, the high school. And transposing that, that to the original map shows it being right on some of the early workings. Um, Bill Holler will speak later today about the historic Isle Royal mine, which was right here, right across the road and right here where we sit. And I believe that if we'd have been here when they were mining it some 5,000 years ago or in that range, we would be able to see where the ancient pits were from right here. They were right where we are today. Um, and at this point, I think we're ready for our first speaker, who is uh, Bill Rose. He's a professor emeritus for, of geology from Tech. Uh, and lately, he's uh, begun uh, geo tours, both here in the city and around, around the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, I've been on a couple of them, and uh, I found them fascinating. Um, and this is Bill Rose. So what I'm going to try to do here is talk about the geological part of this. And I'm really going to avoid archaeology just because I don't know anything about it. Okay? And so what I know about it, I've learned from all you guys. And it's a very interesting part of it because it demonstrates, I think, one of the things that I'm most interested in about the Copper Country, and that is uh, geo-heritage. Because what it shows us is that there is a North American Bronze Age equivalent, uh, which is sig worldwide significance. And it's not quite the same as the European Bronze Age or the African Bronze Age, but it's still very remarkable and it demonstrates unique aspects of this area in geoheritage and um, that really stems from earth science or really from the deep earth 
and it's a message of a very unique treasure that came from the deep earth for reasons that we don't understand. We don't, we're not even close to understanding it. And uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do, and that's really why I call it a geomystery here. And it's something that scientists won't give up on. You'll see people studying the copper here, not for archaeological reasons, but for planetary reasons. And that's an important issue, I think, for all of us to be aware of, even if you're mostly interested in the archaeological part. And so if you aren't interested in this, this is a good time to leave. Because <laughs> I'm not going to talk about people much. I, I have a... If you're interested in these topics, I, I have a website. It's a vast website. It's the result of four years of work. And it's going to be maintained forever by Michigan Tech. And... Um, the only thing you need to remember about it are the two words at the top, Keweenaw Geoheritage. And everything else is there. And this is a growing, evolving thing, which centers on places to go outside. And there are hundreds of places to go outside. And this site will show you where they are and tell you why Earth scientists think they are important sites. And sites of geoeducation, and so on. And so that's the, the whole point of this, but it centers around a new word, that's that geoheritage word, which really encapsulates the idea that the Earth and Earth features influence people's lives. And certainly the theme of this conference is compatible with that idea. We have, probably in the whole world, a place that has uniquely more geoheritage than almost any place. And that's one of the things to celebrate. But most of the people who live here, they're aware maybe of geoheritage not as a word, but they're aware of the fact that earth science influences their lives. But they can't really articulate it. Uh, this is just an aerial view of Isle Royal that shows you some of the unique aspects. I mean, we have incredible geodiversity here, many, th many ways in which earth science influences us. Um, one of them is that this is the site of the largest hotspot really in the history of the Earth, a place where volcanism was generated on a scale that is almost unknown other times in Earth history. Um, we, ha we are also the site of uh, enormous quantities of what we call red bed sandstones. These are the things that filled the great hole of the rift that formed as a result of the hot spot. We are the site of native copper mineralization on a scale that is not known anywhere else on Earth. And copper doesn't occur in that form in general, it occurs as a sulfide. We don't know why this is the case. We are the site of a gigantic thrust fault, which bisects the whole peninsula and which gives us a unique access to an insight into the great earthquakes of, of the Earth because the fault is exposed at the surface in actually many, many places. And it creates a landscape. It uplifted the copper so that it is close enough to the surface that people can find it without the fault that 
would never have happened. It creates the most interesting landscapes on the peninsula, including all the waterfalls that are significant. Um, and then, in addition to that, we have a beautiful glacial history here glacial deposits that are unique and unusual, and which led to the discovery of continental glaciation by um, scientists like Louis Agassiz. And, and then we are also the site of the most unusual large lake in the world because it's located in the middle of a great continent and creates a unique climate and weather conditions day to day, which are completely unusual and illuminating and important. And so there's many, many things to be learned in this area, which are all encapsulated in the idea of geoheritage. These, we were able to take those flaws and make efficient practical weapons and tools that'll hold up. And that's what happened in, in the age, ancient ones, it's the same things inside. If you rip them apart, peel them apart, you'll find those flaws, sometimes more, sometimes less. That's, that's that celt or chisel we are made. You see how we're pushing all those flaws together? When we get to this point, this, this is a product that can be traded, transported easy, has, has uh, no sharp edges, doesn't mess up with the containers you're in, whether it's a, in the woodland period, in a birch bark canoe, or the late archaic, or, or if it's in the early archaic, in a dugout, or in, a, in packs. It's the same thing they did with lit lithics. They reduced them down so they could bring more of the product, whether the product went to them or they traded it. So it's a very efficient way. And we find those all over. <coughs> find them all over. Larry, yes. Don Spahn's presentation will be covering these. Yep. Yeah. Sp Don, Dr. Spahn's presentation will be covering these in part or a lot further than us. A little more work on them. We've lost that piece. Well, you see it up there now. <clears throat> Next. Next. Now, look at the difference in colors of these. They're different colors. And that rat tail is a kind of an oddball in color than the others uh, when on, on the final product. I think the next one, you'll see it change color again. It'll be different. Yeah, see, now it's more gold. And they're taken from a known Latin long location. We can actually put these into a computer software. So, um, uh, because they have this thing called an XYZ coordinate. The Z being the amount of enrichment of the lake. So I use this concept to then produce maps of where you see the lead enrichment factor. So we're actually going to get a glimpse into how the mining activity shifted across the peninsula. And you guys in this room will be outside of my committee and people that are in my defense, the first people to actually see these maps in the public. <clears throat> these are, if you're familiar with ArcGIS, you, I'm not going to kind of bore you with all this other stuff. But I, I preconditioned the data a little bit, and I clipped it just to the elevated ridge on the Keweenaw Peninsula where I have coverage. So using this approach, I found, I found four distinct phases of copper mining activity. Phase one I call from 9,600 years to 8,400 8, years before present. Um, and that's here. We're going to focus only on the Keweenaw records because there isn't much spatial coverage. Um, on Isle Royal. There's only two sites. It's a big island. So we're going to actually look at these maps right now. So there's a blank map. Um, 
Red's going to be more pollution. Blue is just natural levels. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's why I got a tech guy on the staff all the time. All right, so here we go. I don't want to keep everyone late. I'm trying to keep this going quick and let's get pumped up. All right. So this can be the world's most exciting animation you will ever see. So here we go. So we're at 9,070 years ago. This is before any detectable spikes at any of my sites. 9,600 years ago, you see the first enrichment factor increase at manganese. Uh, this is Copper Falls Lake. This is Seneca Lake. This is Boston Lake. It doesn't really matter about the lakes. Just remember the, the time and the area. That's phase one. So that is, I think you can interpret this. Oh, I'm going to talk about this, but that's the mining shifting through time. So this is phase two. It's a shorter period, only 300 years, 8,100 to 7,900 years before present. So there it is. Again, you see this pattern over and over again. It starts at manganese near Copper Harbor and Portage Lake down these are two excellent natural ports. It always shifts, then it typically shifts to Copper Falls, which is near Eagle Harbor. Then we have phase three of, phase of the four phases. This is another 300 year period. And then the last period, that this is the one that's typically associated with the old copper complex that is characterized by the Oncanto Cemetery and Osceola and such. So the implications from this um, suggest that ancient copper mining is uh, detectable on lake sediments. Um, in this region. And these prehistoric emissions appear to be lower than detected at using this method other places in the world. This has been done in China and South America. The, this is the first study that's applied this kind of approach in the Keweenaw Peninsula or in, in, in the Michigan Copper District area. Um, I want to note, this is for the archaeologists, metalworking pollution in North America appeared to occur before the regional emergence of agriculture. This is very unique in the world. Um, and unlike the places like Europe, Asia, South America, where these other uh, studies have been conducted. Um, this has, I think, huge social implications. Um, the timing and the location of these patterns could be related to inherent uncertainties in the radiocarbon dating. Because there's always error. How much so, I don't really know. It's only going to be improved with more lake sediment studies, more radiocarbon dates. So don't think of these maps as static. They're, gonna, they're living. They're going to be revised, probably, if, if I ever get funding, which is never going to happen, but <coughs> um, through time. So just keep that in mind. Um, but I want to suggest to you that these patterns are probably related to how the ancient copper miners sought out and exploited copper deposits. They're a window, a new insight outside of the artifacts into the ancient copper industry in North America. Brand new window. And these, um, uh, for example, confirmed in the historic record. For example, numerous accounts uh, from Copper Falls Lake note, this is up by Delaware Central Cliff Mine, note the extensive ancient copper remains. Um, Whittlesley documented these on the northern side of the trap range. They're in these A's. See these little small depressions? Um, he uh, states that you can also see here's the shafts. So they're, they're quite shallower than the actual historic shafts. So here's an example of one of the shafts. Excuse me? Oh, sorry. So here's the cross section of... Um, oh, you can't see it. Here's a cross section of the copper rock on the, near Copper Falls. This is the Copper Falls Mine uh, Company. 
So you're seeing the stratigraphic layers of the rock here. These are actual the shafts driven into the rock. This is, uh, these A's represent these tiny little depressions on the surface of the rock. But they ended up being about 10 to 20 feet deep. That Whittlesley noted um, that they, as being ancient copper mines. So there's one, two, three, four, and then Copper Falls Lake is right back here. Um, so here's, I just kind of threw in a picture of one of those shafts, like what you're seeing right here. Here's the shaft going into the rock. This is kind of a side thing. Here it is here. <clears throat> so what That's right under our, our feet here at the school. Actually, uh, within about a thousand feet, both northeast to southwest of this site. We'll see it here as we move on. Just a look down orientation. The uh, star is where we are now at the school. This is a view of Houghton for you that aren't from the area. And general flow line, the next slide is a closer up. The area we're gonna focus on here is Guntlock Road, which is the road out in front of the school that runs northeast and southwest, roughly between what's now on this slide called uh, Nananan Road, which is now Pilgrim Road, and the credit union up north at the uh, Sharon. It's a half mile section, and it's a very interesting and very busy mining area, as you'll see. It's not exactly the, uh, Chicago's magnificent mile, but nevertheless, it's extremely busy. Here it is, a look down today in 2015, again with the school as the key factor. Here's an 1897 shot. The black arrow is that same distance. There were 12 mine shafts on this site in, by 1900, within a quarter mile of this half mile, roughly. So if you go down to computer mechanics up to the MTU, that's what was going on here in 1900. Here's a little detailed closer map. You can see the iterations. Uh, a particular kind of a little trivial aside, if you look at Huron Town here, there's a left bank and a right bank. The right bank was originally called Perkinville, and you'll notice the lots are smaller. Perkin was a treasurer for the Isle Royal Mine in 1900 when the mine was rebuilt and uh, he didn't see about giving away that much land property to the, the mines for their houses. So that's just a little interesting aside, but the whole track, we're on a seam of copper as we'll look down uh, from above. If you think this is confusing, all the names of the Isle Moyle copper mine used between 1850 and 1930s, are, these are only partial listing. The stockholders went crazy trying to stay on top of it. Is this mic cutting in and out or what? Let's go take a look underground real quick. Hey, Bill. Sir. Go back to that last slide really quick. Surely. What is all of this? I mean, I see a lot of different things going on. These are the mines that Isle Royal absorbed, bought. Uh, they bought the Huron mine, which extends further all the way up to, uh, oh. Walmart. Walmart. Yeah. Uh, and down, thank you very much. The Webster mine was in here. The Fru mine was over on the edge of the hill here towards town. Uh, I mean, there's just a million and one properties that they gobbled up throughout the area. Some of them were failed properties. They just picked up the leases on, but nevertheless, they took land grabs wherever they could get it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, super, thank you. Underground, here's a slice. Again, the H is our high school where we are, we're right on top of number two shaft, the new number two shaft. I'll explain that a little detail later. Uh, it's 4,500 deep approximately. If you look at the black and white slide, you'll see we're on the eastern edge of the copper loads that run parallel to Guntlock Road, and that's why Guntlock Road is there and, and these mines are here. 
The green areas of that slide were the areas where the copper rock was. The yellow areas were poor rock that, you know, they didn't want to mine out. Next. Went one too many. Here is a very interesting side of underneath. This is a very wide uh, drift for even this uh, Isle Royal mine. You can see the, on the top right, you can see in the lower right, you can see the angle at which the copper rock is intrusive into the uh, field rock, about 45 degrees at this point, and that's what they were taking out. Again, you can see the stoping action because they didn't want to mine any of the rock, to either the head wall or the foot wall side, they just wanted the rich rock. These would be loaded up down with uh, copper rich rock. They'd be bradished up like this and blocked up. The mine cars would come underneath. Somebody would pull the chute up. They'd let this naturally avalanche down in the mine cars and then take it out the, uh, take it out the shaft house. Another shot of underground. Lots of times because of all this mining activity that goes back to before the Civil War, the records were poor, the records were lost. Again, with all these consolidations of mines, the records went off the, off the page. There were cave-ins became quite frequent. Here's a shot where you can see railroad tracks and everything have fallen into a stope from a former mine. Good evening. Uh, my name is Richie Brown. I'm a, a Ho-Chunk Nation tribal member, and a Ho-Chunk is uh, down in central Wisconsin. We've uh, we're scattered, so I guess our main reservation is in Black River Falls, which is uh, so, uh, west central Wisconsin. But we come up to far north is uh, uh, Shawano County. We're in Wittenberg, Wisconsin. We've got a uh, sites there, then we're over on the Wisconsin River in uh, uh, Nakusa, we go down to uh, Baraboo, uh, Wisconsin Dells, we're also over in uh, La Crosse. We, we have uh, tribal land scattered all across the state, but uh, what I'm here today to, is to talk to you about the, the sites that are here in Copper Country, and um, Professor Shears, I've been a student of his for 40 plus years, but I'm also a friend of his. And last uh, year, he, he had an opportunity to do some traveling with Rob, and then they, they talked about this conference, and then, of course, Jim said, yeah, I'll do it, I'll be up there. And, uh, so when he got back to Wisconsin, he called me, and he asked me to, if I wanted to ride along, which I thought would be fun, yeah, I'll go. So, But then about three weeks ago, Jim showed up at my house with uh, three boxes of books and said, I can't make it. Uh, why don't you go? I said, okay, Jim, I'll do it. So, but uh, his daughter came to town, so I don't blame him for that, for visiting with her instead of the long ride up here. But it's, uh, I thought it'd be a little sunnier day, though. So it was uh, surprised to me this morning when I was stayed down in Waters Meat last night. I, I got that far after work. So, and uh, the, the site we're going to talk about today is Eagle Rock. And well, right now it's uh, Eagle Mine, which is north of uh, Marquette. And um, Jim and I were up here, we were over in Ontonagon looking at a site over there years ago. And Jim's friend um, um, from Marquette called him. Uh, I will see his name on these slides. but. He worked up at Huron Mountain for years as an instructor there, and he had a lot of land there by um, just south of the Huron Mountain Club, and that's when they, they started talking about this copper mine over there. And of course, because he owned so much land around it, he didn't want to see that the site developed, so he asked us to come and have a look at it, a look at uh, Eagle Rock. So we uh, took a ride up there, oh geez, I can't even remember how long ago it's been, but we come up first, our first trip there, we just kind of, that's before there was any mines or any fences or gates or any, any, even anybody around. So we spent a lot of time walking around the site and looking at it, and then uh, there was so much there that 
we, we knew it was uh, more than just another uh, rock outcropping in the middle of nowhere. So uh, we decided to survey it, and at the same time, we, we, uh, we started to do a little research, and uh, my tribe has uh, our elders, there's a group of them that are the clan leaders. There's 10 clans left in the tribe. There was 14, we're down to 10 now. But uh, the clan leaders pretty much decide uh, um, any, uh, you know, anything that uh, has a cultural aspect to it, you go to them and they're the, the final authority. What, whatever they tell you, that's pretty much the way it is. So once we looked at the site and we started surveying, then uh, Jim said, well, uh, he started thinking, he said, well, maybe we should see if they know anything about it. So I, and we, we had enough sites up here anyway, so we, we brought them up. I, there's, uh, like I said, 10, and I got six of them in their van, and we, we come up for a few days, and we stopped at uh, Down and Waters of Meat. We stayed there, but then we, we took them out on a, a pontoon out onto the, there's an island in uh, Lac View is there, and it's, uh, uh, it's not a real big island. But there, if, if you look on the state map between uh, Michigan and Wisconsin, you'll see there, there's two lines and, and the, it turns. And the turn for the state line is right on this island. So we got out on the island, we're walking around, and the, the turn itself, you can see there's a monument set there. But the monument is set right in the back of a whale mound. Now, you, you, uh, it's significant enough that the, the surveyors set that, so the, there's are not a lot of people that actually say, well, let's go have a look at this marker, but if you took the time to go out and see it, you'd, you'd see the whale mound. But the island also has a lot of other um, features on it, which are significant because the, um, well, I guess the, how I got involved with Jim was years ago, I worked for the, the Ho-Chunk in their lands department. And we were looking at uh, what they'd give me as a task of the clan leaders or, or the, the different uh, groups. Would, in their stories, all our, all our oral history is every winter they, they, they'll, they used to sit and tell before TV and the internet and all that. They'd get together and they'd, they'd tell these stories but uh, the stories are, you learned them verbatim, so it's word for word. And the stories they had told of all the, you know, all these different events or, or periods in, in our history. But uh, the problem they had, they, they weren't in any kind of a chronological order or, you know, or the, even the locations. It'd been so long since they, this happened that a lot of them had forgotten the, where these sites were. So that was one of the things I was tasked with, is that they'd, they'd uh, tell me the stories and give me as much about uh, the background of the sites as uh, they thought was pertinent. And then it was up to me to go find the site. So because uh, my, uh, well, Jim was an engineering professor at UW-Madison for years. And I was, uh, my background is in land surveying. So that's how I met Jim Shears. After that, then Jim kept, uh, whenever he got uh, someplace he wanted to go, he'd call me. And then, we, like I said, we were over here at Ontonagon looking at some features. And he said, well, let's go over to Marquette and have a look at what, uh, I'm trying to remember this guy. My, my memory's getting old, too. But Fred Ridholm, yeah, that's it. Fred wanted us to look at. So we went to Fred's cabin. He showed us around. We were up on the site. Then we started to survey it. And about that time, we brought up our traditional court and showed them the site. And we showed them several other features. We were over in Barragon. We showed them the, the mounds there that the, the tribe owns in there, right on the, the lake shore there. And then uh, we had one other meeting rooms. We sat down and discussed it. And our, then the, the clan leaders started talking. And then they, then they. Uh, told us a story, they, they, they related the, the story that went with this Eagle Rock, but uh, I had a, a 3D model of, of it, but what it, what it is is uh, 
The name of the story that they, they recalled was Under the Deer's Tail. That was the name of the site. But if, if, you, uh, if you've ever been on Eagle Rock and looked at it, when you stand on top of it, that, there, there's, there's uh, two, uh, two distinct rocks there that it, it splits. And what it, what it looks like is it looks like you're looking at a deer's butt. And so it, but th that's the rock, you know, that's the, uh, most of the rock. So. And then he, he, they told us a story, and it, it goes back to almost to the last ice age. So that's, that's how far back we're going. Okay, listen, thank you all for coming and for your interest in copper. I am here to present my project. I'm not gonna take much of your time. You're still gonna see a handout. Some of you were able to get a copy. If you didn't get a copy and you want one, I've got extra business cards, so see me after. I, I'm kind of an environmental freak. I, I don't like to print more than I, I've often had to throw them away and I don't like that, so. I didn't print as many. Okay, um, what the handout is, is just a demonstration of my project and all of you are important to this project. And maybe by the time I'm done, you'll understand why. This is called the Copper Artifact Master Database, CAMD for short. And what it is, is it's a compilation of all copper artifacts, an attempt at getting as many as I can, of copper artifacts found in the Americas. So I'm talking about Canada all the way down to South America, and I'm trying to compile all of them. Now, it's not gonna happen, right? But it's an attempt. And right now, the database is at nearly 51,000 pieces. So it is, it's an ongoing project. I started about four years ago. In fact, let me tell you about how I got into this. Um, in uh, 2007, I became a volunteer at the Copper Culture uh, State Park, the uh, Ocanto Archaic Copper Museum, we call it, which is known as the oldest copper burial cemetery in the nation. And even though the datings have been disputed, there are quite a few people who will say, who will tell you that copper tooling probably goes back further than that. Um, the reason, when I left there, I, I, I took my copper, my love of copper with me, and I had a newsletter already that I was giving members of the Copper Culture Historical Association. So I decided to keep going with, with the newsletter and keep researching copper, because I thought it was fascinating. And you're gonna see up here, I have a, I have a binder this green one right here, it has all my newsletters in it from the beginning, it's in its fifth year now. This, this copper newsletter is free to anyone who wants to subscribe. Okay, I have about 94 on my list right now. And um, so what I do in the newsletter is I just, I just disseminate some of the things I'm finding out. But what I do is I go to museums and collectors all around the country and, and wherever I can find them and I ask them to share their database for this project. Because what it is, is it's for all of us. This database, what do you, what do you think a copper industry looks like if all of these copper artifa artifacts are dispersed in all of these collections and in, in museum basements and in storage, and how are we ever going to see what the, day, the industry really looked like? How are we ever gonna understand the people that created these? But I really got into this because I was interested in the trade network of the people who were here pre-contact. So you're gonna see these maps here. These maps here I created for different presentations and things, but they kind of, they, they show the rivers and how important the rivers, we all know this, right? We know how important the rivers were to them. That's how they traveled. So I, I, like, I like to look at, with this copper database, where things traveled. Where can we find this that is also showing up over here? What time period could this, might this be, have been created in? And, and this, this really can open up our research. And I will get this published so that everybody can access it. I was thinking about a book, but then I thought, you know what? Most of you would probably say, well, I'm only interested in one county or one state. Why would you buy a whole book? So I was thinking of putting it on the website and making sections of it available.
Good afternoon. Hasn't this been a wonderful conference? And I really appreciate uh, Bob and Robin and Larry and all the others who have worked so hard to make it successful. Let's give them a hand. Now I know what most of you are actually thinking. You're thinking, how does that guy up there on the stage have the nerve to wear a coat and jacket and a dirty old baseball cap? Uh, there's two answers to that. The first one is Donald Trump. I'm just following his example. The second one, which is really the only one that counts, is my wife isn't here. <laughs> Today, I'm going to give you a peek, just a peek, at the typology of old copper culture artifacts, prehistoric American Indian copper artifacts. A wise man once said, Half of what I know isn't true. I just don't know which half. Now, I'm not that wise man. I'd say 60% of what I know isn't true. But it used to be 70%. Before that, it was 80%. So perhaps I'm gradually getting closer to the truth. Like grandma used to say, there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom or knowledge is knowing that tomatoes are a fruit. Wisdom is not putting them in a fruit salad. Okay, let's have the first slide. All right, let's you and I, together with the old copper culture people, take a walk into the nearly forgotten past. Go ahead. And here we go, go ahead. What you're looking at are nearly two dozen spear points that have been typed. There are, each one is distinct and it's a distinct type with its own name, its own class, its own description. Go ahead. Uh, typology is narrowly defined, or narrowly defined typology is the study of types and a systematic classification of artifacts with common functions and characteristics into types. In a broader, more practical sense, typology is that part of taxonomy involving the taxonomic classification of whole copper artifacts, starting with kingdoms, families, kinds, division, genres, types, and varieties of types. And then we go into parts of artifacts. And the parts are made up of segments and in each segment are traits, and then we have characteristics of the traits, segments, and parts, okay? <clears throat> the projectile point division, for example, is divided into several genera. Arrowhead, atlatl heads, harpoons, spear points, darts, and so on. And today we're going to talk primarily about the spearheads. And a spearhead is a symmetrical right and left projectile point. The business end of a spear, attached to a long staff and used for hunting or war. Next. How old are American Indian copper artifacts? We think we know the age of some of the copper artifacts, but we're not nearly as sure uh, of most as we would like to be. We, uh, Dave talked yesterday about the early mining dates. I'm not going to go in that. He did an excellent job. We were all very interested. In addition to this, he had the 
uh, 92,000 years ago, we had an earlier spike. Go ahead. Uh, here we have uh, the Reardon artifacts, and I think those two points are right here. And uh, the interesting things about, uh, thing about this is, in addition to the date and everything, that they had a direct carbon association. In other words, it was the wood in the shafts here that they dated. So we know that that wood belonged to that artifact. It was a part of that artifact and was roughly the same date as the artifact. Not only that, they had him sent to two different laboratories and both came up with approximately the same age. So that's the, the best way of doing it. However, in many archeological digs, you don't have that luxury. In many archeological digs, you have no, nothing directly associated with the copper that you find. If you're lucky, you might have an indirect carbon association, which means perhaps at the same level, five, 10 feet away is a fire pit with some charcoal in it. So you can date the charcoal and assume that the artifact is the same age as the charcoal. Next. <clears throat> Advancing glaciers ripped native copper from Isle Royal and the Antagonon Peninsula and pushed it or floated it uh, in front of the glacier all the way to Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. Populations following the retreating glaciers, maybe 18,000 or so years ago, surely found copper. How long did it take them to recognize the malleability and, the, and begin manipulating it into implements and organments? A hundred years ago, a thousand, I mean, uh, did it take them a hundred years before they decided they, to try pounding it? Did it take them a- Drain the basin, the Deer Lake Basin, uh, it exposed the original Deer Lake, the original lake, and it's just a small, in, in, the, in the Deer Lake Basin was like 660 acres, I think, or something like that. But the original lake is only a small little 100 acre lake. It's like a big, more like a huge pond more than anything, because it's not a very big lake. And this is a photo that was taken after they drained, this is a photo that's taken after they drained the basin. And you can see this is the inlet, which is the Carp River, which feeds into that little lake right here. And just over in the corner, you can't see it, but the Carp River goes in and it goes out. It, it just, it goes in and goes out on the same end of the lake. It's kind of odd uh, geologically how that, how that lake is set up. And, uh, and at that time, I also met uh, uh, John Gordo. And John Gordo was, uh, he had actually been a student of Marla Buckmaster's at NMU and had gone through a couple of her field schools. And John uh, agreed with me. He agreed that uh, based upon what my thoughts were on, on, on Paleonians being in the UP, uh, in, based upon his research and his thought processes that were going along at the same time, he agreed. And he says, why don't we, let's, let's, I'll join you in the search. He says, let's get out on that lake. He said, there's a golden opportunity to walk, to walk along a lake, the original lake that was formed some 11 or some 12,000 years ago, and we can walk that shoreline and maybe something's there. And, and, and I said, yeah, <laughs> there's a good idea. And so we did it, and we started, but we didn't start till late in, 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 in 1986. We started a little bit later in the, in the early fall. And, uh, and we found things that you would expect to find in a, in a reservoir bottom. Of course, we found fishing poles, we found boat, old ro wooden rowboats and the such. But lying amidst some of the historic artifacts that skirted around the lake, there were surface artifacts that we ended up uh, surface collecting and documenting. And again, anybody who looks at these artifacts, if you have any, if you have ever had any experience dealing with Paleo-Indian artifacts, your eyeballs are going to light up when you see these, because this is Hickston, this is, this is an orange Hickston, that's white, more of the, the white typical that you see of the Hickston, the gray colors. These are again our, 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 blade, our blade tools in, uh, from non-local quartzites, okay? These aren't from around here. And so we knew that we were on the, we were on the right trail. But what happens every year uh, back in Ishming is exactly what happens every year here. <laughs> it, it, winter comes, and, and, and we, of course we got, hit with, we got hit with snow. 
uh, and that was, the end of the, that was the end of the project for then. So we, we couldn't wait till 1987, till the spring to show up. And, and, and people, uh, uh, I don't know if anybody here, I asked this question before, does anybody remember the winter of 1987? Everybody's going to go, do you remember it? Okay, there's some people who actually remember it. I asked that question, usually no one does, except one time, a uh, guy raised his hand, he said, oh yeah, I remember in 1987, he started r rattling off all of these statistics on rain, or on snowfall and everything else. It was Carl Bonak, and he happened to be in the audience. It's a true story. <laughs> I said, well, Carl Bonak actually remembers what it was like in 1987, but I don't expect anyone else to. But anyway, 1987, is the summer of 86, excuse me, the winter of 86, 87, was a very, very different year than what we usually encounter here in terms of winter. Because uh, in we were actually in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a regional drought at the time, actually. And, and uh, so there was very little rainfall that, that the previous fall, very little snowfall. But the other thing that happened was it was very, very warm. It was nice that winter. So there was little snowfall, very warm. There were several thaws and it occurred. And so what happened was that by the time March rolled around, the first day of spring, uh, back in Nagani, it actually looked like the first day of spring. It, it, you know, the sun was shining, most of the snow had melted out of my yard and such. And, and, and that morning, in, in, uh, uh, the morning of, of, the, this, of March 21st, I'd gone to Marquette with my wife, and uh, uh, we had, had four kids in the back seat, and we headed up to Marquette and, uh, and on, just to do some shopping. And I'm looking at all of this nice warm weather, and I know the snow's melting, and I can't wait. I've been sitting there all winter waiting to get out to Deer Lake. I'm just itching. And, and this is an honest-to-God true story, okay, what I'm going to tell you. And I know yesterday, we, Rich, Richie was up here and he was talking about some of these, what he thought were some visions or whatever that he thought that he, he saw and then something happened afterward. Well, take, you know, understand what he was saying and, and believe him. Because here's what happens to me. We're coming back from Marquette and I just come in, in, into Nagani and actually coming down across the Carp River Bridge, going to head up into Nagani. And I'm looking out the window and and I don't even know how to, how to describe it because it's, it's kind of weird when you talk about it now. Because I don't want to say it was a vision or a premonition or anything else. But I saw in my mind a pale Indian spear point laying on, on, on the surface. And it wasn't just a pale Indian spear point. It was, in my mind, I could see a Scots Bluff spear point. Honest to God. And I told my wife, and she's sitting over there, and she's, kids, kids are yapping in the back, and I said, you know what I'm going to do today? I said, I said I'm going to get a hold of John Gordo. I'm going, out to, I'm going to head out to, to, uh, to uh, Deer Lake. I'm going to go find a Scotts Bluff spear point. Now, my wife had no idea what a Scotts Bluff spear point was. And, and she looked at me, first of all, like I was nuts. And, and she just basically ignored what I just said. <laughs> when I got home, uh, I called John. And I said, John, I said, John, I said, there's, I know there's some bear spots on the North Shore of that lake. What do you say we get out there this afternoon? We got a little bit of daylight left. Let's head out there. He says, John said, yeah. And John lived just a couple blocks away from the lake. He lived in Deer Lake location. And so I went over and I, and I, I picked up John. I, I, I drove over to his house, picked him up. We drove down to the lake. I got out of the car, out of my car, and I told John, I said, John, I said, let's go find a Scotts Bluff spear point. I actually said those words, okay? And so we took off, but on, on, the, on where we parked, it was still snow on, on the south side of the lake. We had to get to the north side of the lake where it had, had more of the exposure to the sun, which you can see here. And there were still lots of spots where there was snow, but there was this pretty good sized bear spot. And it was also in a spot where the previous fall, we had found one of them really nice Hickston unifaces. So we headed right to that site, we zeroed in on it. And when we got there, we started walking, and it, it took a while just to get accustomed to the fact that you're looking at snow and mud, and, 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 and you know, nothing had, it hadn't rained yet, so it, things are lifted up from frost, and so it was kind of, it was really awkward trying to see anything on the surface. And it took us a little while, and we didn't, we, we, for the first maybe half an hour or so, we didn't see anything. And I remember John saying, we're not finding anything, not even a flake over here. And he was getting a little bit discouraged. And we, we stopped to talk, and, 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 uh, uh, and we were talking about it. And I said, well, let's just continue searching. And I remember in, in John, he was going to walk south, south direction, and I was going to walk north direction but we're only a matter of a couple feet away. And we only got about 20 feet apart and, and, uh, and John hollers to me. And I'm walking this way looking like this and John goes, Jim, get over here, quick, you gotta come see this. And I turn and I look at John and he's kneeling down and he's, and he's, he's, just, he's kneeling down and he's focused on the ground. And, and I don't think anybody here knows John Gordo, but John Gordo is one of the most unexcitable human beings you ever met in your life. He's very, very boring. Great friend of mine, but very, very boring. 
And for, for, uh, for John to be excited, I knew it had to be something. So I like book her over to where, where John is kneeling and he goes, look at this! And here's what he's pointing at. And he's pointing at a Scotts Bluff Paleo Indian spear point laying in the rock matrix, as you can see. And I recognized it, again, immediately for what it was. It was a Scotts Bluff spear point made from Hickston Silicified Sandstone. And again, uh, the dates, I know we talked about this yesterday, one of our speakers was talking about how when you start throwing around dates, you're talking about ar archaeological times. You really got to be careful between, make sure you differentiate between radiocarbon dates and calibrated, you know, uh, uh, calendar uh, years. And, but uh, these gospel spear points, it, it's, a, it's a late Paleo-Indian projectile point that was used by people in, in, in here in North America uh, back dating, it's been found on sites that have the radiocarbon dates date from about 9500 to 8800 BP, uh, radiocarbon years. And that equates out to, uh, in terms of calendar years, uh, to around 10,800 to 9,000 to 9,800 calibrated before present years. And so, conservatively, I always throw out the date. It's 10,000 years old because you're actually, you're, you're, right in, you're right in the ballpark when you say that. And, uh, but anyway, you can imagine how excited we were. I, co I couldn't believe it. I was, I, was, I was, you're like in disbelief, but you're like dancing at the same time. And, and, uh, and so that's, it, so, and, and, and then right away, I mean, within a matter of seconds, uh, we're just totally uh, elated at what we found. John, see, we're kneeling on the ground now, and John goes, oh my God, here's another one. And he points off, off his, his leg, and they're laying in the, in the, in the rocks again, in the, in the dirt, is another point. And then we both stand up and we go, my God, here's another one. And, and, and sure enough, laying next to that one was another Scott's Bluff spear point. This one not made from, uh, from Hickson, by the way. It's made from another material. And when we stood up and when we looked, we were standing on a concentration, surface concentration, of Paleo Indian spear points. And here you can see three of them. There's one here, one here, and there's one just peeking out of the dirt right there. Well. <laughs> We did it, you know, and John and I were just, you know, we thought, oh my God, this is, I can't believe it, you just can't believe it. And as we sat there, and then the next thought was, okay, now what do we do? And John, you know, said, well, we got to get these out of here because someone else is going to come here and find them. I went, no, 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 no. Here's what we're going to do, John. We're not touching them. We're going to leave everything here exactly as it is. Nobody's going to come over here. It's, it's March. Nobody's going to come walking over here. Nobody's going to find these. We're going to leave them laying exactly as they are. We're going to go back and we're going to call every archaeologist we know and tell them to get their butt out here. And back then, the only archaeologist I knew was Marlon Buckmaster. So, <laughs> so I went back and I, we, we, we went back to John's house. And, 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 uh, and I can remember, it was, it was a weird feeling when you walk away from that. And, and I remember, just we did, we walked away from it. And, and uh, we got to John's house and uh, called Marla. And she wasn't home, left a message. Just, and she always laughs about this frantic message that we left on her, on her answering machine. She still tell, talks about it. And I can just imagine, blah, 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 we're blabbing on the phone. And, uh, and then I actually called John Halsey down in Lansing but at his office, but it was a Saturday, so I knew John wasn't going to answer. But I left the message on his phone of what we had found. And, uh, and then what we did was, John went to his refrigerator and had two cans of Blatt's beer in there, and we popped them tops on that Blatt's beer and we sat there and we drank our beer and we celebrated, we clinked in glasses. And it was at that point that I told John, you know, one of the things that uh, when, you, when you document a site uh, and you get a state site number, you know, with the state of Michigan, one of the great things about it is you get to name the site, whatever you want. And, and, uh, and I decided at that point that, uh, uh, that the site was going to be called the Gordo site. And I just wanted to do it to honor John for the help, that, for what he had done. And he was actually the person that said, let's go there and look. And he invited me to be with him on that day. So in gratitude to that, I, I named it that. And, and, uh, and when I think back through all of the years, I wish I had called it the Paquette site. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but I named it the Gordo site because of that. And uh, that's why it's got the name, that's why it's called the Gordo site. And uh, the other thing I did was, uh, what we did was, uh, we made immediate preparations. Marla called back. We made preparations for an immediate visit to that site the following morning. And Marla was going to gather up uh, equipment and, and, and help, and uh, she was going to come out to the site. And in the meantime, I called my dad, who was, a, uh, who was, a, uh, who was not only the greatest dad there ever was, he was one of the greatest photographers there ever was, he was a, a noted, award-winning photographer. And I called my dad and I said, Dad, you ain't going to believe what we found. I said, get every camera you got. 
I said, and fill in with film. I said, we need black and white, and we need 35 millimeter ectocrine. This is before the days of digital, of course. And uh, so I said, grab every camera you got, load them with film, I'm gonna do the same. I said, we gotta take pictures of everything tomorrow. I said, I want pictures. I said, I said, I said we're gonna get there early, we're gonna start taking pictures. We're gonna document this till everybody's sick of the documentation photos. And I, and I actually said these words, this is kind of funny. I said, I want pictures of people taking pictures. If somebody has to go to the bathroom, you gotta get a picture. I said, we can always sort of the pictures away later. My dad sort of laughed, but I didn't mean that. But actually, but I actually said those words from. Well, anyway, the next morning, uh, uh, my dad and myself and John were the first on the site. This is my dad, Bob Paquette. And, and, uh, uh, and he showed up with his camera equipment, I showed up with mine. And we were waiting yet for Marla, because Marla had to, had to go, it was Sunday morning, Marla had to go to the lab, pick up equipment, pick up John Anderton and a few other things, and, and head out to the site. So she was going to be a little bit late. But we got there first, and, and we got again for the second time to actually look at what we had found the day before and to see the artifacts. And we got to take the very first photographs of these incredible artifacts that were laying there. And some of the photographs themselves are pretty incredible. When I look back at these photographs, and that's the, one of the very first photographs that we took, and that's the first projectile point, the first spear point that John had pointed to. That's artifact number one, number, <laughs> number one uh, from the Gordo site. And that's just, to me, that's just an incredible photo, you know, because of the rock matrix and, and everything else. <clears throat> Very shortly afterwards, though, after we had taken photos, and oh, and by the way, that's when uh, my dad decided to take this trophy shot here, uh, because before anybody got there, my dad said, hey, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to get together with this group. It's exciting to see a group of graduate students, professional archaeologists, collectors, historians, geologists working on this topic. Um, the archaeology of prehistoric copper in the Great Lakes is something um, that's been part of my interest as a professional archaeologist for quite some time, several decades, and it's what got me interested in archaeology. Uh, I grew up on the northeast corner of Wisconsin in Marinette County, on the shoreline of Lake Michigan, uh, a border city, Marinette Menominee Twin Cities. And my father was a practicing attorney, had an interest in archeology, span um, had worked at the Riverside Excavations. My uncle had worked on that site as well with Bob Arushka. And when my family moved to the water uh, in the early 1970s, Lake Michigan was relatively high then, higher, considerably higher than it is today. And the shoreline in the Marinette area was eroding away, and we began to find Native American artifacts on our property and the adjacent shorelines, including copper. And I became very interested in thinking about how did people live in the neighborhood that I lived in over the last thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years? How has the landscape changed, and how did people adapt to that environment? Particularly thinking about what would it be like to live in the Upper Great Lakes in February, uh, and how would you make a living uh, in that environment? I attended the University of Wisconsin La Crosse uh, as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin Madison uh, for my master's and doctorate. And my primary research in terms of publications for my dissertation had been in old copper, red ochre, prehistoric, archaic metal technology use in eastern North America. But I've worked on sites uh, all over Wisconsin, into Michigan, into Minnesota and Iowa. I've worked on Paleo Indian sites all the way up to historic and have taught at a number of University of Wisconsin campuses, Lawrence University, I'm now the, the president of Lake State. What I'd like to do is take you on a, a brief tour and uh, we'll look a little bit at, at some typologies and talk a little bit about copper technology and then look specifically at the primary mortuary sites that were excavated in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s by a number of institutions in Michigan and Wisconsin. And ultimately, archaeology, and my shift from an avocational to a professional, was the move from the collection of stuff to becoming a social scientist. Archaeologists, by definition, are part of the social sciences, and the primary focus of archaeology is understanding human behavior. So the collection of artifacts, the collection of uh, data in the field, is a means to get to that interpretation. And the data, the artifacts themselves, have minimal meaning unless they can provide means to have inferences or uh, learn something about prehistoric human behavior, if you're a prehistoric archaeologist. So what I'm going to do is first we'll look at artifacts, and then I want to move to looking at the data from the few excavated mortuary sites that have been professionally excavated, 
and look at what can we learn about the social organization of the peoples that produce these tools. City within their societies, maybe roles about male and female related to sex roles within the community, and also the importance of trade and the impact of this technology on prehistoric trade systems and on social systems in the upper Great Lakes. So that's really the direction that I'm headed. For Next slide, please. Uh, you've seen a lot of interesting, I apologize, I, I arrived here during the uh, Gordo presentation. That's a great site. I've handled the Renier, the Pope materials. I've only seen the Gordo materials in slide format, so it was exciting to see that. I haven't seen, had the benefit of seeing all the presentations today. I enjoyed Don's presentation and the typology work that he's doing. What I want to do is just show you a few slides. I've handled somewhere between five and 10,000 copper pieces in Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota and show you some variety uh, of these forms and then talk a little bit about just looking at the variation of tools of what we can infer about the societies in terms of how these people made a living based on these tools. So you've seen today all kinds of projectile points, fishing gear, um, a whole variety of different forms and I applaud the work of those that are trying to, to tease out better ways to classify these things. One of the challenges of that with copper, unlike stone, is because it's malleable, the things, artifacts can be recycled and reused and contracted and expanded routinely. And uh, that's one of the challenges of working with this compared to stone. When you rework stone, it gets smaller. Copper, you can contract and expand it using the same technology that was used to make it. So there's no question that these people were expert hunter-gatherer fisher folks also expert textile weavers, also expert woodworkers. And we know this from the variety of tools that have been found in the tens of thousands of surface collections. Next slide, please. Uh, if you were to think about archaic lifeways in the Great Lakes or in Eastern North America, they are classified as a lifestyle with a very broad spectrum of diet and technology. Compared to Paleo-Indians, the people that preceded archaic peoples, the original first explorers of the Great Lakes, that most of the evidence suggests that they were terrestrial hunters. There are very few of any Paleo-Indian sites. There's only two or three I know of in the, the upper Great Lakes that have produced any evidence of fish. Archaic sites, by comparison, across all of eastern North America show a very broad spectrum diet of people moving toward high yield resources at certain times of the year. And if you think about this area, Throughout the year, there are certain resources that are abundant in large quantities at certain times. Fish spawnings, migratory waterfowl, certain nuts and berries, movement of terrestrial games such as uh, white-tailed deer, or white-tailed deer you, uh, yard up and the winter up in this part of the woods. We know from the few habitation sites that have been excavated, well-excavated sites, from the same time period of roughly 6,000 to 3,000 years ago, pertaining to the people that made these tools, that folks are moving across the landscape to take advantage of high yield foods at certain times of the year. Probably living in larger aggregates during the warmer weather and then breaking up into smaller microbands or smaller societies to navigate the winter months. And the technologies found at these sites support that as well as the kinds of sites, where they are, what kinds of resources people are focused on. And this is actually from the southeast but it's a great slide. It obviously isn't Houghton in February, right? Uh, but it depicts all of the activities that you see within the toolkit or the subsistence kit of archaic peoples. Fishing technology, the very first watercraft technology absolutely documented in the Great Lakes associated with archaic peoples. Netting technology, whole variety of terrestrial game, aquatic game including reptiles, fish, muskrat, some of the copper harpoons that Don showed, and I'll show you a few others, are clearly used for muskrat, large fish, uh, um, amphibians and probably uh, uh, reptiles uh, in the form.